Chapter Six, Part Seven of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume One by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 6, Part 7 Second and Third European Expeditions of Darius, Battle of Marathon Having suppressed the rebellion, Persia had three things to do. Greek Asia was to be reorganized, Persian Europe was to be reconquered, and those free Greek states which had made war on Persia and occupied Sardis were to be punished. Artaphernes caused the territories of the Ionian cities to be measured and surveyed, and regulated the tributes accordingly. It was also ordained that the cities should no longer have the right of making war upon one another, but there was more to be done. The revolt had taught Persia that the system of tyrannies did not answer, and it was now resolved to make an experiment of the opposite policy. The despots were abolished, and democratic governments were set up. The world may well have been surprised to see the great despotism of all favouring the institution of democracy. It was a concession to the spirit of the Greeks, which reflects credit on the wisdom of Darius. The king's son-in-law, Mardonius, was sent to reassert Persian supremacy in Thrace and Macedonia, and through Macedonia he proposed to advance into Greece in order to punish the two cities which had helped the Ionian rebels. A fleet sailed along the coast and subdued the island of Thasos on its way. Thrace was reduced, and Macedonia, then under King Alexander, submitted a submission which was to be avenged in distant days to come by a descendant and a namesake. But the Greek expedition could not be carried out, since a disaster had befallen the fleet, which was partly wrecked in a storm off the perilous promontory of Athos. Mardonius returned. He had lost many ships, but he had fulfilled the more important parts of his task. But Darius was sternly resolved that Athens and Eretria should not escape without chastisement. Their connection with the burning of Sardis had deeply incensed him. It seemed an insult which the great king's pride could not let pass unnoticed. Moreover, Hippias, the banished tyrant, was at the court of Susa, urging an expedition against the city which had cast him out. It was decided that the new expedition should not be sent by way of Thrace and Macedonia, but should move straight across the Aegean Sea. The cities of the Persian seaboard were commanded to equip warships and transports for cavalry, and heralds were sent to the chief cities of free Greece that were not at war with Persia, requiring the tokens of submission, earth and water. In most cases the tokens were given, and among others by Aegina, the enemy of Athens. The command of the army was entrusted to Datis and Artaphernes, a nephew of Darius, and they were accompanied by the aged tyrant Hippias, who hoped to rule once more over his native country. The armament, six hundred galleys strong, according to Herodotus, Setting sail from Samos, made first for Naxos, the island where Aristagoras had failed. The inhabitants abandoned the city and fled up into the hills, and the Persians burned the town. The sacred island of Delos was scrupulously spared, but soon after the Persians had departed, it was shaken by an earthquake, and the unwonted event was noted as a sign of coming troubles. Having sailed from isle to isle, subduing the Cyclades, the fleet went up the channel between Euboea and Attica, and, reducing Charistus by the way, reached the territory of Eretria. It is strange to find that Athens and Eretria had made no common preparations to meet a common danger. 
Eretria was severed from Attica only by a narrow water, and yet there was no joint action. Athens indeed directed the colonists whom she had settled in the territory of her dependency Chalcis to assist their Eretrian neighbours, but she sent no other help. We hear of sharp engagements outside the walls of the Euboean city, but within seven days it was delivered over to the invaders by the treachery of some leading burghers. The flames which consumed the temples of Eretria were a small set-off against the flames of Sardis. The inhabitants were enslaved. Of all the Greek towns which were involved in the strife between Europe and Asia, none was more ill-fated than Eretria. The Persian generals had accomplished the lesser half of their task. It now remained to deal with the other city which had defied their king. Crossing over the strait, they landed their army in the Bay of Marathon. For the second time an exiled tyrant of Athens came down from Eretria to recover his power. The father had come fifty years before with but a few mercenaries. The son came now with the forces of Asia. Yet so far as winning support at Athens was concerned, the foreign host was the weakest argument of Hippias. The house of the Pisistratids had many bitter enemies, but none was more bitter than one who had also known what it was to rule as a tyrant, Miltiades, son of Simon. We have seen how he returned from the Chersonese after the Ionic Revolt. His enemies accused him of the crime of oppressive rule in the Chersonese, but he was acquitted by his fellow citizens, to whom he had brought the gift of Lemnos and Imbros. His hatred of the Pisistratids was natural. They had put to death his father Simon, celebrated as a victor in the Olympian chariot race. It is not surprising that Miltiades, who was active as a party man, who was known to be a hot foe of the tyrants, who had probably more first-hand knowledge of the Persians than any other man at Athens, was chosen as the strategos of his tribe. He was the soul of the resistance which his country now offered to the invader. Athens had changed much since Hippias had been cast out, though a generation had not passed. Athenian character had been developed under free democratical institutions. It has been said that if the Athenians had not been radically different from their former selves, Hippias would easily have recovered Athens. In other words, if the Persian invasion had happened twenty years sooner, the same stand would not have been made against it as Athens now made. The liberty of Greece would have succumbed. But it was no mere accident that the blow had not been aimed twenty years sooner. The Persian invasion was brought about by the same political causes which enabled Athens to withstand it. The Ionian Greeks would not have risen in revolt but for the growth of a strong sentiment against tyrannies, the same cause which overthrew the Pisistratids and created Marathonian Athens. On the other hand, if the Ionic revolt had broken out before the expulsion of Hippias, Athens would have taken no part in it, and the Persian invasion of Greece might not have followed. As the story is told by our historian, one would almost think that the enemy had already landed on Attic soil before the Athenians bethought themselves how they were to defend their city and their land. A fast runner was dispatched in hot haste to Lacedaemon to bear the news of the fall of Eretria and the jeopardy of Athens. The Lacedaemonians said that they would help Athens, they were bound to help a member of their league, but religious scruples forbade them to come at once. They must wait till the full moon had passed. But when the full moon had passed, it was too late. The whole army of the Athenians may have numbered about nine thousand. The commander-in-chief was Callimachus, the polemarch of the year, and the grave duty of organising the defence rested upon him and the ten generals of the tribal regiments who formed a council of war. Fortunately for Athens, Callimachus seems to have been willing to hearken to the counsels of Miltiades, and the joint authority of the polemarch and the most influential general outweighed the scruples of their less adventurous colleagues. The enemy had landed near Marathon, and clearly intended to advance on unwalled Athens by land and sea. 
The question was whether the Athenian army should await their approach and give them battle within sight and reach of the Acropolis, or should more boldly go forth to find them. This was a question which it devolved upon the Athenian people itself to decide. The hour when the assembly met to deliberate on this question was the most fateful moment in the whole episode. Miltiades proposed that the army should march to Marathon and meet the Persians there. To have proposed and carried this decree is probably the greatest title of Miltiades to his immortal fame, but if the tyrants had not pulled down the city walls, it would assuredly never have been carried. The plain of Marathon, stretching along a sickle-shaped line of coast, is girt on all other sides by the hills which drop down from Pentelicus and Parnes. In the northern part, and on the extreme south, the soil is marshy, and the plain is cleft into two halves by the path of a torrent coming down from the hills through the northern valley in which the village of Marathon is situated. Two roads lead from Athens to Marathon. The main road, turning eastward, passes between the mountains of Hymettus and Pentelicus, and traversing the deem of Pellini, skirting Mount Pentelicus, and then turning due north when it reaches the coast, it enters the plain of Marathon from the south. The other road, which is somewhat shorter but more difficult, continues northward, past the deem of Sophysia, and running into the hills north of Pentelicus finds two issues in the Marathonian plain. It divides into two paths, which encircle the hill of Catronae, the northern path goes on to Marathon and descends into the plain from the north along the banks of the torrent, the other, passing by a sanctuary of Heracles and descending the valley of Avlona, issues in the plain at its southwestern corner, close to the village which is now called Vrana. Callimachus took the northern road by Sophysia and encamped in the valley of Avlona not far from the shrine of Heracles. The choice of this admirable position was more than half the victory. The Athenians were themselves unassailable in the lower valley, except at a great disadvantage, and they commanded not only the mountain road by which they had come, but also the main road and the southern gate of the plain, for the Persians in attempting to reach that gate would be exposed to their flank attack. At this period Athens had accomplished strategists and the brilliant campaign against Boeotia and Chalcis sixteen years before has prepared us for the ability which our commanders now displayed in the presence of a graver peril. The Persians had encamped on the north side of the torrent bed, and their ships were riding at anchor beside them. It was to their interest to bring on a pitched battle in the plain as soon as possible. On the other hand, the Athenians had everything to gain by waiting in their impregnable position. If they waited long enough, they might hope for help from Sparta. Help from another quarter had already come. When they reached the sanctuary of Heracles, they were joined by a band of a thousand Plataeans, who, in gratitude for the protection of Athens against the Theban yoke, now came to help her in the hour of jeopardy. Some days passed, and then, as the Greeks remained immovable, the Persians would wait no longer. Having embarked a part of the army, including the whole body of their cavalry, they made ready to move upon Athens by land and sea. The land force must follow the main road by Pellini, and was therefore prepared for battle, in case the Greeks should attack them before they defiled from the plain. Another critical moment had come for the Athenians, but the Polemarch and the generals had probably decided already what should be done when this contingency arose that Miltiades, as before in the assembly, so now in the camp, urged the boldest course, we may well believe. But the supreme direction belonged to the Polemarch, and he decided to attack the enemy as they marched southward. Callimachus, whether he acted of his own wit or by the counsel of others, showed now a skill in tactics as consummate as the skill in strategy which we have already witnessed. Outnumbered by the foe, if the Athenian line had formed itself in equal depth throughout, it would have swept the Persian centre into the sea, but then it would have been caught in a trap, 
between the sea and ships on one side and the Persian wings, which would have closed in, on the other. Accordingly, Callimachus made his own centre long and shallow, so that it would cover the whole Persian centre, while his wings, of the normal depth, would be opposed to the wings of the enemy. The long Persian line crossed the bed of the torrent and advanced along the shore. A large portion was detached to mask the Greek position, a precaution which was dictated by elementary principles of strategy, in order either to prevent or to repel a flank attack. With these troops to cover them, the rest of the host might march securely past. The Greek army had perhaps already appeared in the recess of the hills at the mouth of the valley of Avlona. Callimachus himself led the right wing. The Plataean allies were posted on the extreme left. Among those who fought for their country on this day, we must notice one who, though he held no post of command, was destined to hold a greater place in Athenian history than any of his fellow warriors, Themistocles, the son of Neocles, who fought in the regiment of the Leontid tribe. Another of worldwide fame, Aeschylus, the tragic poet, also bore shield and spear, and charged the Medes on this memorable day. When the Greeks drew near to the line of the enemy, they were met by volleys of arrows from the eastern archers, and to escape this danger they advanced at a run into close quarters. The hoplites did not fail the generals. Their valour secured the victory which masterly strategy and tactics had prepared. All fell out as had been foreseen. The Athenian centre was driven back towards the hills by the enemy's centre, where the best troops, including the Persians themselves, were stationed. But the Athenian wings completely routed the wings of their foe. Then, closing in and leaving the vanquished to reach their ships if they could, they turned upon the victorious Persians who were following the retreating Greek centre. Here again they were utterly victorious, breaking up the array of the enemy and pursuing them in confusion to the shore, where all who escaped the sword were picked up by the ships. Only a portion of the Persian army had been engaged. The main body doubtless embarked as soon as they saw the first signs of the disruption of the force on which they had relied to cover them from the enemy. It was not a long battle. The Athenian loss was small, 192 slain, and the Persian loss was reckoned at about 6,400, a number whose very moderation stamps it as probably near the truth. Datis and Artaphernes had still an immense host, which might retrieve the fortune of the campaign. Athens was not yet out of danger. The Persian squadron sailed down the straits and rounded Cape Sunium, while the victorious army, leaving one regiment on the field of their triumph to guard the slain and the spoils, marched back to defend Athens. They halted outside the city, near the shrine of Heracles in Sinosarges, on the banks of the Elysus, and they beheld the fleet of the enemy riding off Phaleron. But it did not put into shore, and presently the whole squadron began to draw out to sea. Datis had abandoned his enterprise. Perhaps he had sailed within sight of Athens only on the chance of finding it undefended, and when he saw that the army was there, shrank from another conflict with the hoplites. But a Spartan army, two thousand strong, cannot have been far from Athens now. It had set out on the day after the full moon, and it reached Athens soon after the battle. We may guess that tidings of the approach of the Spartans, if not their actual presence, had something to do with the sudden departure of the invaders, who, though they had received an unlooked-for check, had not endured an overwhelming defeat. The Spartans arrived too late for the battle. They visited the field, desiring to gaze upon the Persian corpses, and departed home praising the exploit of the Athenians. The scene of the battle is still marked by the mound which the Athenians raised over their own dead. Callimachus was buried there, and Cynegyrus, a brother of the poet Aeschylus, who was said to have seized a Persian galley and held it until his arm was severed by an axe. 
Legend grew up quickly round the battle, and there was no historian to record at the time what had actually happened, so that when a generation had passed, the facts were partly forgotten and partly transfigured. Three motives were at work in this transfiguration. The love of the marvellous, the vanity of the Athenians, and the desire of his family to exalt the services of Miltiades. Gods and heroes fought for Athens. Ghostly warriors moved among the ranks. The panic terror of the Persians at the Greek charge was ascribed to Pan, and the worship of this god was revived in a cave consecrated to him under the northwest slope of the Acropolis. Out of this grew a story which added a charming incident to the chain of Marathonian memories. The fast runner, Pheidippides, speeding through Arcadia on his way to seek Spartan help, had been accosted by Pan himself, who had asked why the Athenians neglected his worship, and promised them favours in the future. But the supernatural can be easily allowed for. It was more serious that the extraordinarily brilliant strategy and tactics to which the success was chiefly due should have faded out of the story, and that Marathon should have been regarded as entirely a soldier's battle. It was soberly asserted and believed that those wonderful warriors had taken their enemy aback by advancing against them for a whole mile at a run. Miltiades, who was doubtless the heart and soul of the campaign, was raised by the Marathonian myth to be the commander-in-chief on the day of battle, and it was explained that the chief command each day devolved upon the generals in rotation. This was an arrangement which came into force a few years later, when the polemarch lost his importance, but it supplied the legend with a ready means of setting aside Callimachus in favour of Miltiades. We need not follow the myth further. The Battle of Marathon was caught up into a cloud of glory which obscured the truth of the events, and historical criticism has been able to rescue only the barest outline. Callimachus, in particular, received less than his due, overshadowed by the fame of Miltiades, and it is interesting to find that there was at least a stone in Athens set up perhaps by his son, which recorded the services of the Polymarch of the Athenians in the struggle with the Medes. A few precious words had been preserved. One mysterious incident connected with the battle must be numbered among those historical puzzles which have never been cleared up. When the Persians were already in their ships, a shield was flashed as a signal to them on the summit of Pentelicus. Who held up the shield, and what did the signal mean? The popular explanation in later days was that it invited the Persians to sail straight for Athens, and the enemies of the Alcmeonids said that they were the treacherous authors of the signal. Herodotus doubted the explanation, but he was convinced that the flashing of the shield was a well-attested fact. In the holiest place of Greece, in the sanctuary of Delphi itself, have been found in recent years remains of the noblest monument of the victory of Marathon. Out of the Persian spoils the Athenians built a little Doric treasure-house of marble from their own Pentelic quarries. It seems to have been a gem of architecture, worthy of the severe grace of the sculptured reliefs which ran round the inside of the building and have been safely preserved under its ruins. The sculptures represent the deeds of Theseus and of Heracles, and the battle of the gods and giants. The descendants of the Marathonian warriors derived perhaps their most vivid idea of the combat from a picture of it, which was painted about a quarter of a century later, one of the famous battle pictures in the portico of frescoes in the marketplace. In one scene the Athenians and Plataeans advanced against the trousered barbarians, in a second the Persians in their flight pushed each other into the marsh, and in the last the Phoenician ships were portrayed and the Greeks slaying the foemen who were striving to reach the ships. Callimachus, Miltiades, Datis and Artaphernes, Cynegyrus seizing the prow of a ship, could all be recognised, 
and Theseus, who was believed to have given phantom aid to the warriors, seemed to rise out of the earth. High above the raging strife, the artist, Mycon was his name, showed the gods and goddesses as they surveyed from the tranquillity of Olympus the prowess of their Greeks smiting the profane destroyers of the holy places of Eretria. The significance of the victory of Marathon as a triumph for Athens, for Greece, for Europe, cannot be gainsaid, but we must take care not to misapprehend its meaning for Greece and for Athens herself. That significance is unmistakable, even if we minimize the immediate peril which was averted. The Asiatic invader had perhaps not yet come to annex. He had come only to chastise. It was enough for him if the rest of the Greeks looked on with respectful awe while he meted out their doom to the two offending cities. His work in Euboea had been purely a work of demolition. He had not sought to annex territory or add a satrapy to the Persian dominion. The Cyclad Islands and Charistus had indeed been compelled to submit to the formal authority of the great king, but it is not proved that Darius thought of reducing the western coasts of the Aegean to the subject condition of Ionia. Thus the danger which menaced Athens may not have been subjection to an Asiatic despot, nor was she threatened by the doom of destruction and slavery which befell Eretria. The Persian army had come to restore Hippias, and assuredly Darius did not purpose to restore his friend to a city of smouldering temples. The Athenians would be condemned to bow beneath the yoke of their own tyrant. They would not become, like their Eretrian fellows, the bondmen of a barbarian master. To be delivered over to an aged despot, thirsting for power and vengeance, embittered by twenty years of weary exile, this was the punishment of the Athenians, and this was the fate which they escaped by their valour on the field of Marathon. If they had lost that battle and the rule of the Pisistratids had been restored, the work of twenty years ago would have had to be done again but that it would have been done again there can be hardly a doubt. The defeat of the Athenians would have arrested, it would not have closed their development. It might even be argued that it would have saved Greece the terrible trial of the later Persian invasion, if that invasion was undertaken solely to wipe out the ignominy of the repulse at Marathon. Probably, if Datis had been victorious, the subsequent attempt of Persia to conquer Greece would have assumed a different shape, but the attempt would assuredly have been made. The history of the world does not depend on proximate causes. The clash of Greece and Persia, the effort of Persia to expand at the cost of Greece, were inevitable. From the higher point of view it was not a question of vengeance, where Darius stopped, the successors of Darius would undoubtedly go on. The success of Marathon inspirited Greece to withstand the later and greater invasion, but the chief consequence was the effect which it wrought upon the spirit of Athens herself. The enormous prestige which she won by the single-handed victory over the host of the great king gave her a new self-confidence and ambition. History seemed to have set a splendid seal on her democracy. She felt that she could trust her constitution, and that she might lift her head as high as any state in Hellas. The Athenians always looked back to Marathon as marking an epoch. It was as if on that day the gods had said to them, Go on and prosper. The great battle immortalized Miltiades, but his latter end was not good. His services at Marathon could not fail to gain for him increased influence and respect at Athens. His fellow citizens granted him, on his own proposal, a commission to attack the island of Peros, for the Perians had furnished a trireme to the armament of Datis, and had thereby made war upon Athens. Miltiades besieged the city of Peros for twenty-six days, but without success, and then returned home wounded. The failure was imputed to criminal conduct of the general. 
His enemies, jealous of his exploits in the Marathonian campaign, accused him of deceiving the people, and he was fined fifty talents, a heavy fine. It is not known what his alleged wrongdoing was, but afterwards, when the legend of Miltiades grew, and the part which he played in the campaign of Marathon was unduly magnified, it was foolishly said that he persuaded the Athenians to entrust the fleet to him, promising to take them to a land of gold, and that he deceived them by assailing Paros to gratify a private revenge. At Paros itself, in the temple of Demeter, the tale was told that when the siege seemed hopeless, he corrupted a priestess of the goddess named Timo, and that, coming to meet her in a sanctuary to which only women were admitted, he was seized with panic, and in his flight, leaping the fence of the precinct, hurt his leg. Certain it is that he returned wounded to Athens, however he came by the chance, appeared on a couch at his trial, and died soon after his condemnation. End of chapter 6, part 7 Recording by Graham Redman Chapter 6, parts 8, 9, and 10 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter 6, Part 8 Struggle of Athens and Aegina at this time, Aegina was the strongest naval power in the Aegean. Hostile feeling had long been the rule between her and Athens, and soon after the fall of the Pisistratids the island had been involved in the quarrel between Athens and Thebes. Legend said that the nymphs Aegina and Theba were sisters, but it was more than sisterly sympathy which drove Aegina to declare a state of standing war, a war without herald, as the Greeks called it, against her continental neighbour. Her ships ravaged for Liron and the Attic coast. It was to be expected that Aegina would side with the Persian when he sailed against her foe, and would cordially desire the humiliation of Athens. The Athenians had some reason to fear that she would give the invader not only her good will, but her active help. Accordingly, the Athenians sought the intervention of Sparta, complaining that Aegina was medizing and betraying Greece out of enmity to Athens. The complaint was listened to at Sparta, and King Cleomenes, proceeding to Aegina, seized ten hostages and deposited them with the Athenians. By this means the hands of Aegina were tied. She was hindered from lending help to the Persians, or hampering the men of Athens in their preparations to meet the invaders. This appeal of Athens to Sparta to interfere and exercise coercion in the common interests of Hellas, and the implied recognition of Sparta as the leading power, has been supposed to mark a climax in that feeling of deference towards her which had been growing up both within and without Greece. The episode has been described as the first direct and positive historical manifestation of Hellas as an aggregate body with Sparta as its chief. This description is an exaggeration, for we must not lose sight of the fact, which is too often forgotten, and which Athens took pains to forget, that Athens was, like Aegina, a member of the Peloponnesian League, and the appeal to the head of the League was therefore a matter of course. The prestige of Sparta had indeed been confirmed and increased by a decisive victory which she had won a few years before over her old rival Argos. The battle was fought at Sipaia, near the hill of Tiryns. According to the story, the Argive generals acted with extraordinary folly, 
and were easily overreached by Cleomenes. They listened for the commands which the herald proclaimed to the army of their enemies, and then issued those same commands to their own men. Learning this, Cleomenes gave secret orders that, when the herald gave the word for dinner, the soldiers should pay no heed, but stand prepared for battle. The Argives dined in accordance with the command of the Spartan herald, and were immediately fallen upon and destroyed by their enemies. The disaster lamed the power of Argos for more than twenty years. The episode of the hostages of Aegina brought to a final issue the great scandal of Sparta, the bitter feud of her two kings, Cleomenes and Demaratus. King Demaratus entered into a private compact with the Aeginetans to thwart the intervention of King Cleomenes. Accordingly, Cleomenes incited Leotychidas, the next heir of the Eurypontid line to which Demaratus belonged, to challenge the legitimacy of his rival's birth. A trial was held. A curious story touching the birth of Demaratus was manufactured and attested, and an oracle came from Delphi declaring that Demaratus was not the son of his reputed father. Leotychidas consequently became king. Demaratus fled to the court of Darius, refuge of fallen potentates, where as the friend of Medizing Aegina he found a good reception. Then Cleomenes and his new colleague went to Aegina and seized the hostages. But the means which Cleomenes used to ruin Demaratus recoiled upon himself. It was discovered that he had tampered with the Pythian priestess at Delphi to bring about the dethronement of his enemy, and fearing the public indignation at this disclosure, he fled first to Thessaly, and then returned as far as Arcadia, where he conspired against his country. The Spartan government deemed it politic to invite him to return, and he accepted their offer of pardon. But his adventures had unhinged his mind. He became a violent madman, striking with his stick every one who approached, and his kinsfolk placed him in chains under the guard of a helot. One day, having forced his keeper by means of threats to give him a sword, he wounded himself horribly and died. Such was the curiously inglorious end of King Cleomenes, who, if he had not been a Spartan, might have been one of the greater figures in Grecian history. But his ambition was cabined and his abilities hampered by the Spartan system. Whenever, if left to himself, he might have pursued an effective policy, he was checked by the other king or the Ephorate. On important occasions during his life, Sparta was called upon to take action in foreign affairs, and on each occasion we find that the policy of Cleomenes falls short of the mark owing to the opposition of his royal colleague. Even as it is, he dominates in Spartan history for more than twenty years. After his death, the Aeginetans sent envoys to Sparta, demanding the restoration of the hostages whom he and the other king, Leotychidas, had delivered over to Athens. Leotychidas had been the accomplice of Cleomenes in deposing Demaratus, and was consequently at this time under the shadow of public displeasure. The Spartans were ready, it is said, to hand him over to the Aeginetans as a prisoner, but the envoys preferred to ask that he should go with them to Athens and compass the restoration of the hostages. The Athenians flatly refused the demand. Aegina resorted to reprisals, and a war broke out. It began with the conspiracy of an Aeginetan citizen named Nicodromus, who undertook with the help of Athens to overthrow the oligarchical government of his city. His plan failed because the Athenians came a day too late. The delay was due to the necessity of increasing their squadron of fifty triremes by a loan of twenty more from Corinth. These ships gained a victory and landed troops on the island to besiege the town, but the Aeginetans on their side obtained some troops from Argos and overcame the Athenians. 
This defeat caused disorder in the fleet, which was then attacked and routed by the islanders. But the double repulse was not decisive, and warfare was protracted between the two cities by desultory plundering raids on their respective coasts. The necessity of protecting Attica from Aegean-Eaton depredations, the ambition perhaps of ultimately reducing Aegina to subjection or insignificance, sensibly accelerated the conversion of Athens into a naval power. End of chapter 6, part 8 Chapter 6, part 9, Growth of the Athenian Democracy the Athenian constitution underwent several important modifications in the course of the twenty years which followed its reform by Cleisthenes. There is reason for thinking that some of the changes which tradition ascribed to Cleisthenes were really not introduced by him. Under his scheme, the power of the archons remained very great. They were usually men deliberately elected for their ability, and if the council of Cleisthenes was a check upon them, they also were a check upon it. The natural development of things was to strengthen the council and weaken the magistrates. And at length, some years after Marathon, this step was taken by means of a change in the mode of appointment. Henceforward they were appointed by lot. Five hundred men were elected by the deems, in the same way in which the council itself was elected, and out of this body of five hundred the nine archons were taken by lot. The result of any system of lot in the appointment to offices is to secure average honesty and exclude more than average ability. Henceforward the chances against any prominent statesman holding the office of chief archon are five hundred to one. It is obvious that the political importance of the chief magistracy now disappears. It is also obvious that a polymarch appointed by lot could no longer hold the post of commander-in-chief. That post must pass to those who were deliberately picked out as competent to hold it. The powers of the polymarch were therefore vested not in a new officer, but in the body of the ten strategi, who were hitherto elected, each by his own tribe. Either now, or not many years later, a reform was introduced by which the whole people elected the generals, but they endeavoured so far as possible to choose one from each tribe, and we know no instance in which the same tribe was represented by more than two. The evil of a divided authority was at first obviated by giving each strategos supreme command for a day, an experiment which to our modern notion seems almost childish. Routine business in time of peace might be transacted on such a system, but a daily change of command in time of war was naturally doomed to failure. There is no reason to suppose that it ever became the practice at the election of the generals to assign to one of the ten a position of supreme authority over all his colleagues during their whole term of office. That would have been a reinstitution of the polymarch in another form. The danger of a divided command was avoided by a simpler expedient. Whenever the people voted a military or naval expedition, they decreed which of the generals should conduct it, and assigned a position of leadership or presidency to one of those whom they chose. But this superior command was limited to the conduct of the particular expedition, and the general to whom it was assigned exercised it only over those of his colleagues who were specially associated with him. We have no record touching the attitude of Cleisthenes to the venerable council of the Areopagus, nor do we hear anything about that body for a generation after the fall of the Pisistratids. But a new institution was originated during this period, which weakened the position of the Areopagus by depriving it of its most important political function, that of guarding the constitution and protecting the state against the danger of a tyranny. The institution of ostracism is traditionally ascribed to Cleisthenes, but it was not made use of till two years after the Battle of Marathon. The ordinance of the ostracismos was that in the sixth prytany of each civil year, 
the question should be laid before the assembly of the people whether they willed that an ostracism should be held or not. If they voted in the affirmative, then an extraordinary assembly was summoned in the marketplace in the eighth prisony. The citizens were grouped in tribes, and each citizen placed in an urn a piece of potsherd, ostracon, inscribed with the name of the person whom he desired to be ostracized. The voting was not valid unless six thousand votes at least were given, and whoever had most ostraca against him was condemned to leave Attica within ten days, and not set foot in it again for ten years. He was allowed, however, to retain his property, and remained an Athenian citizen. By this institution the duty of guarding against the dangerous ambitions of influential citizens was transferred from the paternal council of the Areopagus to the sovereign people itself. Footnote. It is important to note that the law of ostracism did not leave it to the discretion of the Council of Five Hundred whether the question should be proposed to the Assembly or not, but ordained that it should be proposed as a matter of course at a fixed time every year. This was an additional safeguard to the people. It has been suggested that ostracism was intended to replace Solon's law against neutrality, and was itself replaced by the graphy paranomone. End of footnote. If this clumsy, and it must be owned, oppressive institution was established by Cleisthenes, it would follow that for about fifteen years the assembly declined every year to make use of it, though it is stated that the chief object of Cleisthenes was to banish a relation of the Pisistratids, Hipparchus, the son of Carmus. And, in fact, this Hipparchus was ultimately banished by the first ostracism that was ever practised. And in the following year Megacles, who, though an Alcmeonid, had espoused the cause of the Pisistratid faction, suffered the same fate. In these acts, as well as in the constitutional reform affecting the archonship, we must see the work of the progressive democratic statesmen, of whom the three most prominent were Xanthippus, Aristides, and Themistocles. These leaders, however, had separate policies and separate parties, and the people were persuaded to ostracize Xanthippus, and two years later Aristides. It is clear that in these cases there was no fear or danger of a tyranny, but that ostracism was used as a convenient engine for removing the opposition of a statesman who hampered the adoption of a popular measure. We cannot guess on what questions Anthippus stood in the way of Aristides or Themistocles, but it is possible that the ostracism of Aristides was connected with the bold naval policy which it was the great merit of Themistocles to have originated and carried through. An excellent anecdote is told of the ostracism of Aristides the Just, as he was called. On the day of the voting, an illiterate citizen chanced to be close to Aristides, who was unknown to him by sight, and requested him to write down the name Aristides on the ostracon. Why, said Aristides, doing as he was asked, do you wish to ostracize him? Because, said the fellow, I am tired of hearing him called the just. End of chapter 6, part 9 Chapter 6, part 10 Athens to be a sea power but the greatest statesman of this critical period in the history of Athens, greater than either of his two rivals, Xanthippus and Aristides, greater than the hero of Marathon himself, was Themistocles, the son of Neocles. It may be said that he contributed more than any other single man to the making of Athens into a great state. The preeminent importance of his statesmanship was due in the first place to his insight in discerning the potentialities of his city, and in grasping her situation before any one else had grasped it, and then to his energy in initiating, and his adroitness and perseverance in following, a policy which raised his city, and could alone have raised her, to the position which she attained before his death. 
In the 6th century the Athenians were a considerable naval power, as Greek naval powers then went, but the fleet was regarded as subsidiary to the army. The idea of Themistocles was to sacrifice the army to the navy and make Athens a sea state, the strongest sea state in Greece. The carrying out of this policy in the face of scepticism and opposition was the great achievement of Themistocles. He began the work when he was Archon, and thus already a man of some prominence, two or three years before the Battle of Marathon, by carrying a measure through the assembly for the fortification of the peninsula of Piraeus. Hitherto the wide exposed strand of Phaleron was the harbour where the Athenians kept their triremes, hauled up on the beach, unprotected against the surprise of an enemy, but within sight of the Acropolis. At that time, after the quelling of the Ionic Revolt, Persian warships were cruising about the Aegean, and the possibility of an attack on Phaleron seems to have opened the eyes of the Athenians to the need of reforming their naval establishment. The hostility of Aegina was a nearer and more pressing motive. The Athenians had not to seek far for a suitable port. It seems strange that they had not before made use of the Piraeus, the large harbour on the west side of the peninsula of Menichia, which could be supplemented by the two smaller harbours on the east side, Menichia and Zia. But the Piraeus was somewhat farther from the city, and was not within sight of the Acropolis like Phileron. So long, therefore, as there was no fortified harbour, Phileron was safer. The plan of Themistocles was to fortify the whole circuit of the peninsula by a wall, and prepare docks in the three harbours for the reception of the warships. The work was begun, but it was interrupted by the Persian invasion and by the party struggles after Marathon. Then the war with Aegina broke out, and this, combined with the fear of another Persian invasion, helped Themistocles to carry to completion another part of his great scheme, the increase of the fleet. A rich bed of silver had been recently discovered at Maronia in the old mining district of Lorion, and had suddenly brought into the public treasury a large sum, perhaps a hundred talents. It was proposed to distribute this among the citizens, but Themistocles persuaded the assembly to apply it to the purpose of building new ships. Special contributions for the same object must have been made soon afterwards. More ships were built, and two years later we find Athens with nearly two hundred triremes at her command, a navy which could be compared with those of Syracuse and Corsaira. The completion of the Piraeus Wall was not attempted at this period, but was accomplished, as we shall see, after the final repulse of the Persians from the shores of Greece. End of chapter 6, part 10 Recording by Graham Redman Seven parts one, two, and three of a history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, volume one, by John Bagnell Burry, chapter seven, parts one, two, and three. Chapter 7. The Perils of Greece, the Persian and Punic Invasions We have now reached the threshold of the second and the greater Persian invasion, the second and the greater triumph of Hellas. The significance of this passage in their history was not lost upon the Greeks. Their defense of Europe against the barbarians of Asia, the discomfiture of a mighty oriental despot by a league of their free states, the defeat of a vast army and a large fleet by their far smaller forces. These surprises made an enduring impression upon the Greek mind, and were shaped by Greek imagination into a wonderful dramatic story, at a time when the critical instinct had not yet developed. 
No tale is more delightful than this tale, as Herodotus tells it, when we take it simply as a tale, and none illustrates better the story-shaping genius of the Greeks. The historical criticism of it is another matter. We have to seek to extract what actually happened out of the bewildering succession of daring exaggerations, naive anecdotes, fictitious motives, oracles, not to speak of miracles, in most of which the reflected light of later events is visibly altering the truth, while much is colored by the prejudices and the leanings of the Athenians, from whom Herodotus seems to have derived a great part of his record. Section 1. The Preparations and March of Xerxes The chief event in Persia during the ten years which elapsed between the first and second invasions of Greece was the death of King Darius. After the unexpected repulse of his forces at Marathon, he had determined to repeat the experiment, and begun to make some preparations. Four years passed, and then a revolt broke out in the province of Egypt, which demanded immediate attention. But its suppression was delayed in consequence of the king's death, and was only accomplished under Xerxes, son of Atosa, who had succeeded to the throne. The question then arose whether the design of an expedition against Greece to avenge those who fell at Marathon, and to redeem the fame of Persian arms, should be carried out. It is related that Xerxes was himself undecided, but was over-persuaded by the impetuous counsels of his cousin Mardonius. On the other hand, his uncle Artabanus appears in the pages of Herodotus as the prudent and experienced adviser who weighs all the obstacles and foresees failure. Xerxes, swayed hither and thither between these opposing counsels, is finally determined to yield to the wishes of Mardonius by the peremptory command of a dream, which overcomes even the scruples of Artabanus. In this manner does Herodotus pretend to take us behind the curtain of the council chamber at Susa, representing, in the light of later events, the advice of Mardonius as youthful and foolish, although that advice merely amounted to the execution of the design which, according to Herodotus himself, the old and experienced Darius had initiated and prepared. Nevertheless, the contrast of Mardonius and Artabanus, and the dreams divinely sent with evil purpose, are, though not historical, a most effective dramatic introduction into the episode of the invasion. Further pressure was brought to bear on the king by Greeks who visited his court. Envoys from the Aluid princes of Thessaly, and members of the Pisistratid family, who brought with them the seer, Onomacritus, to impress Xerxes by favorable oracles. It was clear that the expedition must consist of a joint attack by sea and land. Preparations were begun by the difficult enterprise of digging a canal, about a mile and a half long, across the isthmus of Mount Athos. On the occasion of the expedition of Mardonius to Thrace and Macedonia, it will be remembered that a large part of the fleet had been wrecked in rounding the dangerous headland. But was it necessary for the fleet to venture on this occasion within the proximity of Cape Athos? Might it not sail straight across the Aegean to Greece? On these grounds Herodotus suggested that the cutting of Athos was undertaken for display rather than from necessity. This is an unsound criticism. It was a fundamental principle of Persian strategy in these expeditions that the army and navy should cooperate and never lose touch. The Thracian expedition of Darius, the Macedonian expedition of Mardonius, the Greek expedition of Xerxes illustrate this principle. The canal of Athos was intended to ensure that the ships should safely accompany the land forces along the coasts of Thrace. It seems to be established that the work was completed and used though later writers threw doubts on the vellification of Athos. When it was finished, the workmen proceeded to lay a bridge over the Strymon for the passage of the army, and preparations were made all along the line of route for the feeding of a vast host. Xerxes came down from Susa to Sardis in the autumn. He met the oriental contingents of his army at Cretella in Cappadocia. At Cainai it is recorded that Pythias, the richest man in the empire entertained at his own cost the king and the whole army. His wealth amounted to four million gold darics. All but seven thousand he kept. Xerxes bestowed upon him seven thousand to make up for the spent sum. Xerxes spent the winter at Sardis. 
Pythias was so pleased with the king's graciousness that when the army was about to start for the Hellespont in the following spring, he ventured to proffer the request that the eldest of his five sons who were serving in the army might be permitted to remain behind. Great was the king's wrath at what he regarded as the insolent demand of a slave. The body of the eldest son was cut in two. One half was placed at each side of the gate of Sardis, through which the army was about to march forth. The antidote illustrates the severity with which military service was enforced. It is impossible to suppose that the whole army wintered in Sardis with the king. It is probable that the place of mustering was at the Hellespont, across which two bridges had been constructed in the neighborhood of Sestos and Abydos by Phoenician and Egyptian engineers. But the strength of these bridges was not sufficient, and a tempest destroyed them. The wrath of Xerxes at this catastrophe was violent. He not only beheaded the engineers, but commanded that three hundred lashes should be inflicted on the waters of the Hellespont. Those who carried out this strange order addressed the sea as they scourged it in these words, O bitter water, our Lord lays this punishment upon thee, for having done him wrong, who never did wrong to thee. King Xerxes will cross thee, whether thou wilt or not. Just is it that no man sacrifices to thee, for thou art a treacherous and briny river. These words are blamed by Herodotus as un-Greek and impious. The reconstruction of the bridges was trusted to new engineers. Two lines of ships were moored across the strait by anchors at prow and stern. The line nearer to the Propontis consisted of 360, the other of 314 triremes and pentateters mixed. Over each of these lines of ships, six huge cables, two of flax, four of papyrus were stretched, and in three places, rows were left between the ships and under the cables for small paddling craft to pass between the Euxine and the Aegean. Planks were laid across the cables and kept in their places by a second tier of cables above. On this foundation, a road was made with wood and earth, and on each side, palisades were set, high enough to prevent the animals which passed over from seeing the water. On a marble throne erected on the shore, Xerxes is said to have witnessed the passage of his army, which began at the first moment of sunrise. The troops crossed under the lash, and the crossing was accomplished in two days. But when the size of the Persian host was magnified in later years to the impossible figure of five millions, the story was that the crossing of the Hellespont required seven days and seven nights, the favor number of fiction, without a moment's pause. The army was joined by the fleet at Doriscus in Thrace. Fleet and army were henceforth to act together. In the plain of Doriscus, Xerxes reviewed and numbered his forces. What nation of Asia, asks Herodotus, did not Xerxes lead against Hellas? He enumerates forty-six peoples, with a picturesque description of their array. The Persians themselves, who were under the command of Otanes, wore coats of mail and trousers. They had wicker shields, large bows, and short spears. The Medes, Scythians, and Hyrcanians were attired in the same way. Then there were the Assyrians, with brazen helmets, linen cuirasses, clubs, lances, and short swords, Bactrians with cane bows, trousered Sakai with pointed hats and carrying axes, Indians clad in cotton, Caspians in goatskin, Serangians wearing dyed garments and high boots, Ethiopians clad in lion skins or leopard skins and armed with arrows whose stone points transport us to a primitive age, Sagartians with dagger and lasso, Thracians with fox-skin caps, Colchians with cow-skin shields. The fleet was furnished by the Phoenicians, Egyptians, Cypriots, Cilicians, Pamphylians, Lycians, Carians, and subject Greeks. It is said to have consisted of 1,207 warships, with 3,000 smaller vessels. A curious story was told of the numbering of the army. 10,000 men were packed together in a close space, a line was drawn round them, and a wall built. All the infantry passed successively into this enclosure. It was filled one hundred and seventy times, so that the whole army of fighting men was one million seven hundred thousand. The number of the cavalry was eighty thousand, and there were some additional troops not included. Adding to these the crews of the ships, counting two hundred to each larger and eighty to each smaller vessel, 
the total was obtained of 2,317,000 men. This enormous number was further increased by fresh contingents which joined during the march through Thrace and Macedonia. Besides the fighting men were a vast number of servants, settlers, and camp followers, whom Herodotus considered to be quite as numerous as the soldiers. The whole host would consequently have reached upwards of five million, not including eunuchs and concubines. It is needless to say that these numbers are wholly fabulous. The facts which Herodotus states as to the number of the fighting men are false, and the principle of his conjecture that the total number of the host was double that of the fighting men is also fallacious. The picked body of 10,000 troops, called the Immortals, had the privilege of traveling comfortably with their wives and baggage. But this was an exceptional privilege, and it cannot be supposed that the mass of the troops were accompanied by servants. There is reason for supposing that the land forces may have amounted to 300,000, hardly more. A larger force than that would have been unmanageable in a small mountainous country, and the difficulties of provisioning even this were formidable. The number of the fleet must also be considerably reduced, perhaps to 800 triremes. From Doriscus, Xerxes proceeded to Therma with his fabulous host, in three divisions, drinking rivers dry in their march. At the crossing of the Strymon, near the place called the Nine Roads, he sacrificed nine native youths and virgins. At Therma, he was rejoined by his fleet, which had been separated from him while it sailed around Scythonia and Palin. Most of the incidents which Herodotus recounts concerning this march of Xerxes are pleasing stories, designed to illustrate the historian's general view as to the great struggle of Greek and barbarian. The cruelty of Xerxes to Pythias, his barbarity and impiety in scourging the Hellespont, served to characterize the barbarian and the despot. The enormity of the host which rolled over the straits the deluge Europe enhances the danger and the glory of Hellas, and to signify, by a solemn portent, the destined discomfiture of the Persian host, it is stated that as Xerxes was setting forth from Sardis, the sun was darkened. This eclipse actually happened two years later. The tradition which Herodotus follows transposed its date to an impressive and significant occasion. Section 2 Preparations of Greece. In the meantime, Greece was aware of the preparations of the great king for her enslavement, and was making her counter-preparations. The digging at Athos had warned her betimes, and the coming down of the king to Sardis showed that the danger was imminent. Xerxes is said to have dispatched from Sardis heralds to all the Greek states, except Athens and Sparta, to demand earth and water. These two cities now joined hands to resist the invasion. They were naturally marked out as the leaders of Greece, in Greece's greatest crisis. Sparta, by virtue of that generally acknowledged headship which we have seen, Athens by the prestige which she had won in resisting the Mede Marathon. They jointly convened in a Hellenic Congress at the Isthmus to consult on the measures to be taken for common resistance to the threatened invasion. We have already observed certain indications of the growth of a pan-Hellenic feeling, but this is the first instance of anything that can be described as deliberate pan-Hellenic policy. It is an attempt to combine all the scattered cities of the Greek world to withstand the power of Persia. It is a new fact in Grecian history, opening scenes and ideas unlike to anything which has gone before, enlarging prodigiously the functions and duties connected with that headship of Greece, which had hitherto been in the hands of Sparta, but which is about to become too comprehensive for her to manage. A large number of cities sent delegates to the Congress, which was called the Synedrian of Prubuloi, or Congress of Representatives. It met at the Isthmus, a meeting place marked out by its central position, under the presidency of Sparta. There, the states which were represented, thirty-one in number, bound themselves together in a formal confederation by taking a solemn oath that they would tie those who uncompelled submitted to the barbarian for the benefit of the Delphic god. This was a way of vowing that they would utterly destroy such traitors. A great many states, the Thessalians, most of the Boeotian states, besides the smaller peoples of northern Greece, Locrians, Malians, Achaeans, Dolophians, and others, took no part in this congress. Their inaction by no means meant that they had made up their minds to Medize. They were only waiting to see how things would turn out, 
and, considering their geographical position, their policy might be justified by the natural instinct of self-preservation. These northern states would be the first invaded by the Persian, and it was hopeless for them to think of withstanding him alone. Unless they could absolutely rely on Sparta and her confederates to support them in defending the northern frontier of Thessaly, nothing would be left for them but to submit. And with this prospect, it would have been imprudent for them to compromise themselves by openly joining the confederacy. Events prove that if they had seriously relied on that confederacy throwing all of its strength into the defense of northern Greece, they would have been cruelly deceived. As we shall see, they were ready to resist so long as there were hopes of support from the stronger states. In some cases, there were parties or classes who were favorable to the Persian cause. For example, the oligarchs of Thebes and the Alaudae of Thessaly. One of the great hindrances of joint action was the existence of domestic disputes. There were feuds of old standing between Thessaly and Phocis, Argos and Lacedaemon, Athens and Aegina. The Congress attempt to reconcile such feuds, and Athens and Aegina laid aside their enmity to fight together for Grecian freedom. Another important question concerned the command of the Confederate forces. The claim of Sparta to the leadership of the army was at once admitted. The question as to the fleet was not so clear. Sparta was not a naval power and Athens, which would furnish more ships than any other state, had a fair claim. But the other cities were jealous of Athens. They declared that they would submit only to a Spartan leader. The Athenian representatives, when they saw the feeling of the allies, at once yielded the point. The Congress made some other provisions. While spies were sent to observe the preparations of Xerxes in Asia Minor, envoys were sent forth to various Greek states to enlist new confederates, to win over Argos, who had sent no delegates to the Isthmus, and to obtain promises of assistance from Crete, Corsaira, and Syracuse. None of these embassies led to anything. Galan, the great tyrant of Syracuse, was himself absorbed by the prospect of an attack of the Carthaginians, and even if he had wished, could have sent no aid to the mother country. When the military preparations for the defense of Greece were made, and the generals appointed, the Congress of Representatives probably met again in spring, and then consign the conduct of the affairs to the military congresses of the commanders who used to meet together and decide on each movement under the presidency of the Spartan leaders. King Leonidas was the leader of the Confederate army, and Eurobiadus, a Spartan, who did not belong to either of the royal families, was commander of the Confederate fleet. The Greeks had abundance of time for their preparations, for strengthening their defenses and building new ships. Athens probably threw herself with more energy into the work than any other city. One wise measure shows that she had risen to a full apprehension of the truth, that a solemn hour in her history had arrived. She recalled those distinguished citizens whom the vote of ostracism had driven into banishment during the last ten years. Aristides and Xanthippus returned home. Their feuds with Themistocles were buried in the presence of the great danger, and the city seems to have shown its confidence in their patriotism, by choosing them as generals. These leaders will each play his part in the coming struggle. Section 3. Battles of Thermopylae and Artemisium About the time when Xerxes reached the Hellespont, the Thessalians sent a message to the Confederacy, suggesting that the pass of Tempe should be defended against the invading army. Accordingly, 10,000 hoplites were sent, but when they arrived at the spot, they found that there were other passes from Macedonia into Thessaly, by which the Persians would be more likely to come. There were passes of Volistana and Petra, which descended into the valley of the river Titoresius, and it was by one of those that Xerxes actually marched. Ten thousand hoplites were not enough to defend the three passes, and it seemed useless and dangerous to occupy this advanced post. Hence, the defense of Tempe was abandoned, and the troops left Thessaly. This desertion necessarily drove all the northern Greeks, between Tempe and Thermopylae, to signify their submission to Xerxes by the offering of earth and water. The next feasible point of defense was Thermopylae, a narrow pass between the sea and mountain, separating Thracis from Locris. It was the gate to all eastern Greece south of Mount Oeta. At the eastern and at the western end of the pass, in those days, was extremely narrow, and in the center the Phocians had constructed a wall as a barrier against the Salian incursions. Near the western end was Anthela, the meeting place of the Amphictyotic Council, 
while on the Locrian side one emerged from the defile near the village of Alpenoi. The retreat of the sea and consequent enlargement of the Malian plain have so altered the appearance of this memorable pass that it is hard to recognize its ancient description. The hot sulfur springs from which it derived its name and the sheer mountain are the two prominent features. It was possible for an active band of men, if they were debarred from proceeding by Thermopylae, to take a rough and steep way over the mountains and so reach the Locrian road at a point east of Alpenoi. It was therefore needful for a general who undertook the defense of Thermopylae to secure this path, lest the detachment should be sent round to surprise him in the rear. The Greeks determined to defend Thermopylae, and Leonidas marched thither at the head of his army. He had about 7,000 men, including 4,000 from Peloponnesus, 1,000 Phocians, 400 Thebans, 700 Thespians and Locrians in full force. It is possible that there may have been some other Boeotians who were not mentioned. Of the Peloponnesians, more than half were Arcadians. Mycenae, free at this moment from Argive control, sent 80 men. There were Corinthians and Thessalians, 1,000 Lacanians and 300 Spartans. So far as the Peloponnesians were concerned, this was only a small portion of their forces, and we may suspect that, but for Athens, they would have abandoned northern Greece entirely, and concentrated themselves at once on the defense of the Isthmus. But they were dependent on Athens because her fleet was so strong, and they were therefore obliged to consider her interests. To surrender Thermopylae and retire to the Isthmus meant the surrender of Attica. But the hearts of the Spartans were really set on the ultimate defense of the Isthmus, and not on the protection of the northern states. Their policy was narrow and Peloponnesian. They attempted to cover this selfish and short-sighted policy by the plea that they were hindered from marching forth in full force by the celebration of the Carnian festival, and that the Peloponnesians were delayed by the Olympic Games. They alleged that the soldiers of Leonidas were only an advanced guard. The rest would soon follow. Yet the feast did not interfere with the movement of the Confederate fleets. As the land arm and the sea arm of the Persian forces always operated together, it was necessary that while the Greek hoplites held the pass under Mount Oeta, the Greek Tyremes should oppose the Persian fleet in the straits between Euboea and the mainland. The Persians would naturally attempt to sail between Euboea and Magnesia into the Malian Gulf, and thence, accompanying the advance of the army along the western shore of the Long Island, to the Euripus. The object of the Greeks was to prevent this, and support the garrison of Thermopylae by controlling the Malian Gulf. The Greek fleet, which numbered 324 triremes and nine pentaconters, the Athenians contributing 200, chose its station near Artemisium, on the north coast of Euboea. Three ships were sent forward to reconnoiter on the Thermaic Gulf, and two of them were destroyed by the Persians. This was the first collusion in the war. The incident is said to have so depressed the Greeks that the whole squadron sailed back to the Euripus. But this is highly unlikely, for it was bound to remain at the mouth of the Malian Gulf so long as Leonidas held Thermopylae. It was, however, necessary that the Euripus should be guarded, for there was the possibility that the Persians might send round a detachment by the south of the Euboa, and so cut off the retreat. As fifty-three Athenian ships were absent during the first conflicts at Artemisium, it may be supposed that they were deputed to the service of keeping watch at the Euripus. In the month of July, the Persian army arrived at Thermopylae, and the Persian navy at the Magnesian coast, between Castanea and Cape Sepius. Their ships were so many that they could not all be moored at the shore, and they had to range themselves in eight lines parallel to the coast. While they were in this unsafe position, a great storm rose and destroyed, at the lowest computation, 400 ships. Thus the gods intervene to lessen the inequality between the Persian and Greek forces. Encouraged by this disaster, the Greek fleet returned to its station at Artemisium. In this account of Herodotus, the main fact is that the Persians suffered serious losses by a storm off the Magnesian coast. But the loss is exaggerated in proportion to the exaggeration of the original size of the fleet, and the movements of the Greeks are probably misrepresented. The story goes on that, Cowed by the numerical superiority of the Persians, even after their losses, the Greek commanders wished to retreat again and were restrained from doing so by Themistocles. The Euboeans were naturally anxious that the fleet should remain where it was, as a protection to themselves, and to secure this, they gave Themistocles thirty talents. 
Of this sum, Themistocles distributed eight in bribes to his colleagues and kept the rest. The facts of this case throw doubt on this story, which was probably suggested by what happened some weeks later at Salamis. For Eurybiadus and the Peloponnesians were bound to stay at Artemisium so long as the land army was at Thermopylae. After the storm, the Persians took up their station at Ephetai. They determined to cut off the Greek retreat and secretly sent a squadron of 200 vessels to sail round Euboea. The news of this movement was brought to the Greek camp by Scylius of Scione, the most remarkable diver of his time, who plunged into the sea at Aphetai, and did not emerge above water until he reached Artemisium at a distance of ten miles. Herodotus, indeed, hesitates to accept this tale, and records his private belief that Scylius arrived at Artemisium in a boat. The Greeks decided that when midnight had passed they would sail to meet the ships which were sailing to the Euripus, but in the afternoon they attacked the enemy just to see how they fought, and they succeeded in capturing thirty Persian ships. The night was very stormy. The gods had again intervened to aid Greece. The two hundred ships, having rounded the southern cape of Euboea, were wrecked off the dangerous coast known as the Hollows. Immediately afterwards, the fifty-three Attic ships, which had not yet appeared at Artemisium, arrived there, and at the same time came news of the disaster. The Greeks consequently gave up the intention of retreating. There was some further fighting, with loss on both sides, but no decisive advantage, according to the Greek account, but we may suspect that the Persians had the best of it. Meanwhile, Leonidas had taken up his post at Thermopylae, and the Phocians, who knew the ground, had undertaken the defense of the by-road over the mountains. The old Phocian wall in the center of the pass was repaired. It was a serious matter for even such a large army as that which now encamped in the Malian plain to carry the narrow way of Thermopylae against six thousand determined men. For four days Xerxes waited, expecting that they would retreat, awed by the vision of his mighty host. On the fifth he attacked, and, in the engagements which took place at the west end of the pass, the Hellenic spearmen affirmed their distinct superiority to the Asiatic archers. On the following day the result was the same. The immortals themselves made no impression on the defenders. Herodotus says that Xerxes sprang thrice from his throne in agony for his army. It was then decided to send round the immortals, hardly the whole ten thousand, under their commander, Hydarnes, by the mountain road to take the Greeks in the rear. A Malian Greek named Epialtes guided the band, and so won the name of having betrayed Greece. At dawn they reached the highest point in the path, where the Phocians were posted. The Phocians fled to the heights, and the Persians went on, paying no attention to them. Meanwhile, deserters informed Leonidas of the Persian stratagem. He hastily called a council of war. The exact plan of action which was decided on is unknown. We only know that the Spartans, Thebians, and Thespians remained in the pass, while the rest of the Greeks retired southward. It was afterwards represented that they had deserted the defense of the position and returned home. But in that case, it was foolish, if splendid, of Leonidas to hold the pass between foes on both sides. The rational courses were either for the whole garrison to abandon the pass, or else, just as the Persians aimed at enclosing the Greeks, so enclosed the band of Hydarnes. We may suspect that the second plan was actually adopted. While part of the force, including Leonidas and the Spartans, remained in the pass, the rest, we may suppose, placed themselves at some distance east of the point where the mountain path descended to the road, so as to take Hardarnes in the rear. Of the fourteen hundred who stood in the pass, some had to guard the eastern entrance against Hardarnes, others the western against the main army. Leonidas and his three hundred undertook the western side, but they were no longer content with merely repelling assaults. They now rushed out upon their enemy. Their charge was effective, but Leonidas himself was slain, and a Homeric battle raged over his body. Two brothers of Xerxes fell. Many Persians were driven into the sea. But at length the defenders were forced back behind the wall. They drew together on a hillock where they made a last stand, to be surrounded and slain by overwhelming numbers. For the immortals, having in the meantime routed the Greeks in their rear, had now forced their way into the pass. It was said that four thousand Greeks fell. The valiant defense of Thermopylae made a deep impression upon Greece, and increased the fame of the Spartans for bravery. It was represented as a forlorn defense, Leonidas and his band devoting themselves to a certain death, and clinging to their posts 
from that sense of military duty which was inculcated by the Spartan system from early youth. The brave Thespians would not desert the Spartans. While the Thebans were represented as detained by Leonidas against their will, because they were suspected of secret medism. The malicious tale adds that, having taken only a perfunctory part in the defense, the Thebians advanced to the enemy and asked for quarter, declaring that they were friends of the great king and had come to Thermopylae against their will. Their lives were spared, but all, including the commander, were forced to suffer the shame of being branded as bad slaves. It is certain that this contrast between the Thespians and Thebians was invented in the light of the subsequent Medism of Thebes. Nor is it clear that the defense of Thermopylae, although eminently heroic, was, until the very end, desperate. If, as we suspected, an effort was made to meet the immortals, then, if that effort had been more effectual, it might have been possible to hold the pass, and in that case a naval battle must have decided whether the Persians or the Greeks would be forced to retreat. A column was afterwards erected at Sparta with the names of Leonidas and his three hundred. Among them was to be read the name of Diakonis, reputed as the author of the famous Mo, which displayed the light-heartedness of a Spartan soldier in the hour of peril. When it was observed to him that the Persian host was so enormous that their arrows hid the sun, he replied, So much the better. We shall fight in the shade. The news of Thermopylae speedily reached the fleet at Artemisium. The Greeks forthwith weighed acre and sailed through the Euripus to the shores of Attica. End of chapter 7, parts 1 through 3. Chapter 7, part 4, 5, and 6 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great. Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 7, Parts 4, 5, and 6. Section 4. Battle of Salamis. Having thus succeeded in breaking through the inner gate of Hellas and slain the king of the leading state, Xerxes continued his way and passed from Locris into Phocis and thence into Boeotia, meeting with no resistance. The Thebans, and most of the other Boeotians now, unable to do otherwise, submitted to the Persians. The loss of Thermopylae forced them to this course, as the abandonment of Tempe had forced the Thessalians. In later days, a story was told at Delphi that a Persian band detached itself from the main host in Phocis in order to proceed to Pytho and plunder the shrine of the god. I think, says Herodotus, that Xerxes knew its treasures better than his own. The Delphins fled up into the heights of Parnassus, leaving only sixty men and the prophet Acheratius in the temple. They did not remove the treasures, for the god said that he would protect his own. As soon as the barbarians approached, marvels began to happen. The prophet saw the sacred arms, which no man might touch, lying in front of the temple, carried out by some mysterious means. And when the Persians came to the shrine of Althena Pronaia, which stood not far from the Castilian fountain, lightning flashed. Two crags rent from Parnassus, fell with a large crash, crushing many of them, and a war whoop was heard from Athena's temple. The barbarians fled in terror, and told how two hoplites of superhuman size pursued them. These were Phalacius and Autonaus, the native heroes of Delphi. Such was the legend told at Delphi of the Persian invasion. When the Athenians returned from Artemisium, they found that the main body of the Peloponnesian army was gathered at the Isthmus, and engaged in building a wall from sea to sea, instead of advancing to the defense of Boeotia, as had been previously arranged. Thus Boeotia and Attica were unprotected. Themistocles and his Athenian colleagues decided to evacuate Athens. They made a proclamation that all citizens should embark in the triremes, and that all who could should convey their families and belongings to places of safety. This was done. The women and children were transported to Troezen, Aegina, and Salamis. The council of Areopagus helped at this crisis by distributing from the treasury of Athena 
eight drachmae to each citizen who embarked. At the same time, the great natural strength of the Acropolis, though its walls had been demolished after the expulsion of the tyrants, encouraged the hope that it might be held against the Persians, and a small garrison was left to defend it. This bold and wise policy of embarkation was dictated by the circumstances, but it was supposed to have been based on an oracle which foretold the utter destruction of Attica with the sole exception of a wooden wall. The wooden wall was interpreted to mean the ships, and to suit this view it was represented that the garrison left on the Acropolis was merely a handful of poor citizens who remained behind and barricaded themselves there because they adopted the more literal interpretation of a wooden barricade. This explanation of the oracle was perhaps suggested by subsequent events. While the Athenians were thus showing that they were not bound to their soil, the allied fleet had stationed itself in the Bay of Salamis, and it was reinforced by new contingents, so that it reached the total strength of 378 triremes and seven pentaconters. The army at the Isthmus was now placed under the command of Cleombrotus, brother of Leonidas and guardian of his son, Pleistarchus, who was still a child. Xerxes arrived at Athens about the same time that his fleet sailed into the roadstead of Phaleron. He found the town empty, but for a small band which had entrenched itself on the Acropolis. Persian troops occupied the lower height of the Areopagus, which is severed from the Acropolis by a broad saddle, and succeeded in setting the wooden barricades on fire by means of burning arrows. The garrison rolled stones down on them, and such is the natural strength of the Acropolis that the siege lasted two weeks. Then the Persians managed to ascend on the precipitous north side by the secret path which emerged close to the shrine of Eglaris. The Greeks were slain, the temples plundered, and burnt. After the fall of the Acropolis, the Greek generals held a council of war, and it was carried by the votes of the majority that they should retreat to the Isthmus and await there the attack of the Persian fleet. The advantage of this seemed to be that they would be in close touch with the land forces and have the Peloponnesus as a retreat in case of defeat, whereas at Salamis they would be entirely cut off. This decision meant the abandonment of Aegina, Salamis, and Megara, and it was strenuously opposed by the Agintians, Athenians, and Megarians. Themistocles determined to thwart it. He went privately to Eurybiades and convinced him that it would be much more advantageous to fight in the narrow waters of the Salamian Channel than in the open bay of the Isthmus, where the superior speed and number of the hostile ships would tell. A new council was summoned, at which, it is said, hot words passed between the Athenian and Corinthian general. When Themistocles opened the debate, without waiting for the formal introduction of Eurobiades, the Corinthian Adimiantus said, O Themistocles, those who stand up too soon in the games are whipped. Yes, was the reply, but those who start late are not crowned. It is recorded that Themistocles, in order to carry his point, had to threaten that the Athenians, who were half the fleet, would cease to cooperate with their allies and seek new homes in some western land if the retreat to the Isthmus were decided. Themistocles won his way, and when it was resolved to fight in Salaminian waters, the heroes of the island, Ajax and Telamon, were invoked, and a ship was sent to Aegina to fetch the other Iacid heroes. Of all the tales of signs and marvels which befell in those memorable days, none perhaps was more attractive to the Athenians than the experience of two Greek exiles as they walked in the Thriasian plain. One was an Athenian named Dicaeus, and his companion was none other than Demaratus, the Spartan king who had sought refuge at the Persian court. As they went, they saw a great dust afar off near Eleusis, such a dust as they thought might be raised by a host of thirty thousand men. And then they heard a voice suddenly from the midst of the dust, and it sounded like the cry of the mystic Iacus, which is cried at the Eleusian festival. Demaratus asked his companion what it might be. It is a token, said Decaeus, of some great disaster to the king's host, for since the plain is desolate of men, it is clear that the thing which uttereth the cry is divine, and it is a thing coming from Eleusis to help the Athenians. If it turned to the Peloponnese, the peril menaces the army of the land, but if it went towards the ships, then are the king's ships endangered. Peace, said Demaratus, for if these words of thine come to the king's ears, thou shalt lose thy head. 
Then the dust, wherein the voice was, turned to a cloud, and rising aloft moved towards the Greek fleet at Salamis, and so they knew that the fleet of Xerxes was doomed. Meanwhile, the Persians too had deliberated and determined to fight. According to a Halicarnassian story told by Herodotus, the Carian queen Artemisia alone gave sound advice, not to risk a sea fight, but either to wait for the Greek fleet to disperse from want of provisions, or to advance by land into the Peloponnese. The southern entrance to the narrow sound between Salamis and Attica is blocked by the islet of Pistalia, and the long promontory which runs out from Salamis towards the mainland. The Greek fleet was anchored close to the town of Salamis, north of this promontory. It would be best for the Greeks if they could lure the Persian fleet to enter the Salaminian Bay so that its flank would be exposed as it sailed through the narrow waters. It would be best for the Persians if they could force the Greeks out into the open sea. Xerxes foresaw the possibility that his enemies might attempt to escape at night, and, to prevent this, he moved his armament so as to enclose the ingresses of the two straits on either side of Pistalia, and landed troops on that island to rescue Persians and kill Greeks who should happen to swim to its shores in the expected battle. These movements, carried out in the afternoon, alarmed the Greeks. The Peloponnesian commanders brought pressure to bear on Eurybiadus. Another council was called, and Themistocles saw that the hard-won result of his previous exertions would now be overthrown. He therefore determined on a bold stroke. Leaving the council, he dispatched a slave named Sicinus to the Persian camp, bearing a message from himself, as a well-wisher to Xerxes, that the Greeks proposed to sail away in the night. If they were prevented from doing so, a Persian victory was certain, owing to the disunion that existed in the Hellenic camp. If the Persians attacked the Greeks here, as they were, the Athenians would turn against their allies. This message was believed, and Xerxes took his measures at nightfall to prevent the Greek fleet from escaping by the western straits between Salamis and the Megarid. He sent his two hundred Egyptian ships to round the southern promontory of Salamis and place themselves so that they could bar the straits and he decided to attack in the morning, a fatal decision which only the prospect of the treachery of some of his allies could have induced him to take. The Greek generals, meanwhile, were engaged in hot discussion. Suddenly, Themistocles was called out from the council. It was his rival, Aristides, who had sailed across from Aegina and brought the news that the fleet was surrounded by the enemy. Themistocles bade Aristides inform the generals of what had happened and the tidings was presently confirmed by a Tenian ship which deserted from the Persians. There is no reason to question the sensational accident that Aristides brought the news, but we need not suppose that this was his first return from ostracism. It seems probable that he had been sent with the ship which fetched the Iacids from Aegina, and that he was one of the ten strategoi. Themistocles had managed that a naval battle should be fought at Salamis, and under the conditions most favorable to the Greeks, the position and tactics of the two armaments have been the subject of much debate. According to the poet Aeschylus, who was an eyewitness of the battle, the Persian ships were drawn up in three lines outside the entrance into the sound. The extreme left wing was composed of the Ionian Greeks, while the right towards the Piraeus was the Phoenician squadron on which Xerxes chiefly replied. The Greek fleet was drawn up behind the promontory of Sinosura and facing northward the Athenians on the left, towards the town of Salamis, and the Agentians probably near them, and the Lacomendonians on the right. On the opposite mainland, on shore, under Mount Aegaleos, a high throne was erected, from which Xerxes could survey the battle and watch the conduct of his men. At the break of day, the Persians began to advance into the straits. The three lines converted their formation into three columns, and the Phoenicians led the way through the opening between Pestalia and the mainland. The Ionians on the left would naturally move through the smaller channel between Pestalia and Salamis. When the Phoenicians came into view, the Athenian squadron immediately advanced, and sailed them in the flank and cut them off from the rest of the fleet, driving them towards the Attic shore. The other Persian divisions crowded through the straits, and a furious melee issued which lasted till nightfall. There was no room for the exercise of tactical skill in the crowded narrow waters where the fairway between Sinosura and Attica is little more than a mile in breadth. The valor of the Aegeanetans was conspicuous. They seemed to have completed the discomfiture of the Phoenicians and to have dispersed the Ionians. The Persians, under the eyes of their king, fought with great bravery, 
but they were badly generaled, and the place of combat was unfavorable to them. By sunset the great armament of Xerxes was partly destroyed, partly put out of action. Aristides, who with the force of Athenian hoplites was watching events on the shore of Salamis, crossed over to Pistalia and killed the barbarians who had been posted there by Xerxes. Among the anecdotes told about this battle, the most famous is that which was current at Halicarnassus, of the signal bravery, and no less signal good fortune, of the Carian queen, Artemisia. She saved herself by the stratagem of attacking and sinking another Carian vessel. Those who stood round Xerxes observed the incident, but supposed the destroyed trireme to be Greek. Sire, they said, seest how Artemisia has sunk an enemy ship, and Xerxes exclaimed, My men have become women, my women men. Section 5 Consequences of Salamis. The Greek victory at Salamis was a heavy, perhaps a decisive blow to the naval arm of the Persian power. The wrath of Xerxes against the Phoenicians was boundless. On them he had relied, and to their infidelity he ascribed the loss of the battle. His threats so frightened the remnant of the Phoenician contingent that they deserted. But the prospects of the ultimate success of the invasion was still favorable. The land army had met with no reverse and was overwhelmingly superior in numbers. The only difficulty was to keep it supplied with provisions, and in this respect the loss of the command of the sea was a serious misfortune. The Greeks represented Xerxes as smitten with wild terror, fleeing back overland to the Hellespont, and hardly drawing breath till he reached Susa. This dramatic glorification of the victory misrepresents the situation. Xerxes was personally in no jeopardy. The real danger lay not in Attica, but in Ionia. The Persians had good reason to fear the effect which the news of the crushing defeat of their navy might have upon the Greeks of Asia, and if Xerxes dreaded anything, he dreaded the revolt which actually came to pass in the following year. It was all important for him to secure his line of retreat, while he had no intention of relinquishing his enterprise of conquering Greece. These considerations explain what happened. The Persian fleet was immediately dispatched to the Hellespont to guard the bridge and the line of retreat. The land forces were placed under the command of Mardonius, who, as the season was now advanced, determined to postpone further operations till the spring into winter in Thessaly. A force of 60,000 men was detached to accompany Xerxes to the Hellespont. When he arrived there, he found that the bridge had been destroyed by storms, the same storms which had wrecked his ships off Magnesia. The fleet took him across to Abydos, and he proceeded to Sardis, which he made his headquarters. The convoy of 60,000 soldiers returned to the main army in Thessaly, and on their way they laid siege to two towns, which afterwards became famous, on the Pallian Isthmus, Olynthus and Potidaea. Olynthus, then a Boeotian town, was taken and handed over to the Chalcedonians, who remained faithful to Persia. Potidaea successfully withstood a siege of three months. Meanwhile, the Greeks had failed to follow up their victory. Cleombrotus was about to advance from the Isthmus with the purpose of aiming a blow at the retreating columns of the Persian forces before they reached Boeotia. But as he was sacrificing before setting out, two hours after noon on the 2nd of October, the sun was totally eclipsed, and this ill omen made him desist from his plan and march back to the Peloponnesus. Themistocles tried to induce the naval commanders to follow up their advantage by sailing after the Persian fleet to the Hellespont, that they might deal it another blow and break down the bridge. It might be expected that, if this were done, the Greeks of Ionia would revolt. But the Peloponnesians would not consent to sail to a distant part of the world, while the Isthmus was still threatened by the presence of the Persian army. The story goes that, having failed to get his advice adopted, Themistocles, with that characteristic adroitness which won the admiration of his contemporaries, determined to utilize his failure. The faithful Sicinus was sent to Xerxes to assure the monarch of the good will of Themistocles, who had dissuaded the Greeks from pursuing the Persian fleet. Themistocles might expect that Xerxes, having been deceived before, would now disbelieve his announcement, and therefore hasten back with all speed to reach the Hellespont, if possible, before the Greeks. But on a later day of his life, when he was in exile, he claimed the Persian gratitude for this service. It was even represented that, with extraordinary long-sightedness or treachery, he had in his view the contingency of being driven to seek Persian help or protection against his countrymen. But the tale need not be seriously criticized, 
it has all the appearance of an invention suggested by subsequent adventures of the subtle Athenian. The island of Andros and the Euboean city Charistus had furnished contingents to the Persian fleet. Just as the Athenians, after the battle of Marathon, had sailed against Paros and demanded a war contribution, so now the Greeks acted against Andros and Charistus. They failed at Andros, just as Mytilides had failed at Paros. They devastated the territory of Charistus. Great was the rejoicing in Greece over the brilliant victory which was so little hoped for. The generals met at the Isthmus to distribute the booty and have judged rewards. The Aegeanetans received the choice lot of the spoil on account of their preeminent bravery, and dedicated in the temple of Delphi, on Apollo's express demand, three golden stars set in a mast of bronze. For bravery, the Athenians were adjudged the second place. Prizes were also proposed for individuals who had distinguished themselves for valor or for wisdom. In adjudging the prizes for wisdom, each captain wrote down two names in order of merit and placed his tablet on the altar of Poseidon at Isthmus. The story is that each wrote his own name first and that of Themistocles second, and consequently there was no prize, for a second cannot be given, unless a first were also awarded. This ingenious antidote reflects the reputation for cleverness which had been won by Themistocles. The Corinthians who fell in the battle were buried in Salamis, and their sepulchral stele was inscribed with a simple distich, telling the stranger that, Salamis, the isle of Ajax, holds us now, who once dwelled in the city of Corinth between her waters. The stone has been recently found, this is only one of many epitaphs composed by nameless author in those days of joy and sorrow in various parts of Greece, all marked by the simplicity of a great age, whose reserve, as has been said truly, is the pride of strong men under the semblance of modesty. In later days, insensible to such reserve, it became fashion to improve these epitaphs by the addition of boastful verses, which have been imposed till recently upon posterity, and the epitaphs thus disfigured were all said to be the workmanship of the poet Simonides. The exposure of these two deceptions increases our admiration for Hellas at the time of the invasion. There were men everywhere capable of writing a simple, appropriate inscription for a grave, and the tombstones of the fallen were not used for superfluous boasts. But the triumph of Hellas had nobler memorials than the unassuming verses of the tombs. The barbarian invasion affected art and literature, and inspired the creation of some of the great works of the world. Men seemed to rise at once to the sense of the high historical importance of their experience. The great poets of the day wrought it into their song. The great plastic arts alluded to it in their sculptures. Phrynichus now had a theme that he could treat without any dread of another fine. Aeschylus, who had himself fought against the Mede, made the tragedy of Xerxes the argument of a drama which still abides the one great historical play dealing with a contemporary event that exists in literature. But the Persian War produced, though not too soon, another and a greater work than the Persians. It inspired the Father of History with the theme of his book, The Contest of Europe with Asia. The theme was afloat in the air that the Trojan War was an earlier act of the same drama, that the warriors of Salamis and Plataea were fighting in the same muse as the heroes who had striven with Hector on the plain of Troy. Men might see, if they cared, this suggestion in the scenes from the two Trojan wars which were wrought by the master sculptors of Aegea to deck the pediments of the temple of Athena, whose Doric columns still stand to remind us that Aegina, once upon a time, was one of the great states of Greece. And in other temples, frises and pediments spoke in the conventional language of sculptured legend, by the symbols of lapiths and centaurs, gods and titans, of the struggle of Greek and barbarian. Section 6. Preparations for another campaign. The words of the poet Aeschylus, that the defeat of the Persian sea host was the defeat of the land host, too, were perfectly true for the hour, but only for the hour. The army, compelled after Salamis to retreat to the north, spent the winter in the plains of Thessaly, and was ready for action, though unsupported by a fleet, for the following spring. The liberty of Greece was in greater jeopardy than ever, and the chances were that the success of Salamis could be utterly undone. For in the first place the Greeks, especially the Lacedaemonians and Athenians, found it hard to act together. This had been shown clearly the year before, eminently on the eve of the Salaminian battle. The Peloponnesian interests of the Lacedaemonians rendered them unwilling to meet the enemy in northern Greece. 
while the northern Greeks, unless they were supported from the Peloponnesus, could not attempt a serious resistance, and were therefore driven to come to terms with the barbarians. And in the second place, if these difficulties were overcome, and a pan-Hellenic force were opposed to the Persians, the chances were adverse to the Greeks, not from the disparity of numbers, but from the deficiency of Greeks in cavalry. In spring, Mardonius was joined by Artabazus and the troops who had conducted Xerxes to the Hellespont. The total number of forces now at the disposal of Mardonius is unknown. It may perhaps have been 150,000. Meanwhile, the Persian fleet, 400 strong, but without the Phoenician ships, was collected at Samos, with the purpose of guarding Ionia, and a Greek squadron of 110 ships, gathered at Aegina under the command of the Spartan king, Leotychidus, for the purpose of defending the coasts of Greece, but not attending to assume the offensive. With great difficulty, some envoys from Chios induced Leotychidus to advance as far as Delos, but he could not be moved to sail further east with the view to the liberation of Ionia, for Samos seemed as far away as the Pillars of Hercules, and he dreaded the Persian waters teeming with unknown dangers. It seems probable that Athenian policy was working upon the Spartan admiral's inexperience in military affairs. The object of the Athenians was to secure their own land against a second Persian occupation. They therefore desired the protection of the fleet for their coasts. But there was a more important consideration still. If the fleet took the offensive and gained another naval victory, the Peloponnesus would be practically secured against a Persian attack, defended at once by a victorious navy and the fortifications of the Isthmus. The result would be that the Peloponnesians would refuse to take any further part in the defense of northern Greece, and would leave Athens a prey to the army of Mardonius. It was therefore the policy of the Athenians to keep the fleet inactive until the war should have been decided by a battle on land, and for this reason they equipped only a few of their ships. Mardonius, well aware of this fatal division of interests between the Athenians and Peloponnesians, made a politic attempt to withdraw Athens from the Greek League. He sent an honorable ambassador, King Alexander of Macedon himself, with the most generous offers. He undertook to repair all the injuries suffered by Athens from the Persian occupation, to help her gain new territory, and asked only for her alliance as an equal and independent power. In a desolated land, amid the ruins of their city and its temples, Knowing well that their allies, indifferent to the fate of Attica, were busy in completing the walls of the Isthmus, the Athenians might be sorely tempted to lend an ear to these seductive overtures. Had they done so, the fate of Peloponnesus would have been sealed, as the Lacedaemonians knew. Accordingly, envoys were sent from Sparta to counteract the negotiations of Alexander, and to offer Athens material help in the privations which she was suffering. Tempting as the proposals of Mardonius sounded, in good reason, as they had to depend little on the cooperation of their allies, the Athenians were constrained by that instinct of freedom which made them a great people to decline the Persian offer. Tell Mardonius, they said to Alexander, that the Athenians say, so long as the sun moves in its present course, we will never come to terms with Xerxes. This answer utters the spirit of Europe in the eternal question between the East and the West, the spirit of the Senate when Hannibal was at the gates of Rome, the spirit of Roman and Goth when they met the writers of Attila on the Catalonian plain. Thus the embassy of Alexander ought to have strengthened rather than weakened the Greek League. It ought to have made the Lacedaemonians more actively conscious of the importance of Athenian cooperation, and consequently readier to cooperate with Athens. It enabled Athens to exert stronger pressure on the Peloponnesians, with a view to the defense of northern Greece, and the Spartan envoys promised that an army should march into Boeotia, but still stronger pressure was needed to overcome the selfish policy of the Peloponnesians. Soon after the embassy of Alexander, they had completed the walling of the Isthmus, and, feeling secure, they took no thought of fulfilling their promise. The Spartans alleged, in excuse, the festival of the Hyacinthia, just as before they had pleaded the Carnia. And in the meantime, Mardonius had sent his army in motion and advanced into Boeotia with the purpose of reoccupying Attica. Once more, the Athenians had been cruelly deceived by their allies. Once more, they had to leave their land and remove their families and property to the refuge of Salamis. Mardonius reached Athens without burning or harrying. He still hoped to detach the Athenians from the Greek cause. Herein lay his best chance of success. 
if they would now accept his former offers, he would retreat from their land, leaving it unravaged. But even at this extremity, under the bitter disappointment of the ill faith of their allies, the Athenians rejected the insidious propositions which were laid by an envoy before the Council of the Five Hundred at Salamis. Immediately the three northern states, which had not yielded to the Mede, Athens, Megara, and Plataea, sent ambassadors to Sparta to insist upon an army marching at once to oppose Mardonius and Attica, a tardy redemption of their promises, with the threat that otherwise there would be nothing for it but to come to terms with the foe. Even now the narrow Peloponnesian policy of the ephors almost betrayed Greece. For ten days, it is said, they postponed answering the ambassadors, and would have ultimately refused to do anything, but for the intervention of a man of Tegea, named Chelios, who impressively pointed out that the alliance of the Athenian power with the Persians would render the Isthmian fortifications on which the ephors relied absolutely useless. One would have fancied that this was obvious even to an ephor, without a prophet from Tegea to teach him. However it happened, the Lacomandonian government suddenly changed its policy and dispatched a force of 5,000 Spartans, each attended by some helots, to northern Greece. Never since, never perhaps before, did so large a body of Spartan citizens take the field at once. They were followed by 5,000 periochi, each attended by one helot. It was clear that Sparta had risen at last to an adequate sense of the jeopardy of the Peloponnesus. The command was entrusted to Pausanias, who was acting as regent for his child cousin, Plistarchus, son of the hero of Thermopylae. At the Isthmus, the Lacomandonian army was joined by the troops of the Peloponnesian allies and the contingents from Euboea, Aegina, and western Greece. And in the Megarid, they were reinforced by the Megarians, and at Eleusis by Aristides, in command of 8,000 Athenians and 600 Plataeans. It was entirely an army of foot soldiers, and the total number, including light-armed troops, may have approached 100,000. The task of leading this host devolved upon Pausanias. The strong fortress of Thebes, which he had abundantly supplied with provisions, was the base of Mardonius, and once the Greek army was in the field, he could not run the risk of having his communications with his base broken off and finding himself shut up in Attica, a land exhausted by the devastation of the preceding autumn. Accordingly, he withdrew into Boeotia, having completed the ruin of Athens, and having sent a detachment to make a demonstration in the Megarid. He did not take the direct route to Thebes, but marching northwards to Decalia, and by the north side of Mount Parnas, he reached Tanagra and the plain of Esopus. Marching up this stream, westward, he came to the spot where it is crossed by the road from Athens to Thebes, at the point where that road descends from the heights of Scythiron. The river Esopus was the boundary between the Thebian and Plataean territories, and the destruction of Plataea was probably an object of the Persians. But the main purpose of Mardonius in posting himself on the Esopus was that he might fight with Thebes behind him. The Persians had every cause to be sanguine. Not only had they superior, though not overwhelmingly superior, forces, but they had a general who was far abler than any commander on the side of the Greeks. Mardonius was not anxious to bring on a battle. He fully realized that his true strategy was to do as little as possible. He knew that the longer the army of the Greeks remained in the field, the more would its cohesion be relaxed through the jealousies and dissensions of the various contingents. We need not take too seriously the story which the Greeks were afterwards fain to believe, that at this moment there was a certain dispiritedness and foreboding of disaster in the Persian camp. An anecdote told by one of the guests at a Theban banquet was thought to illustrate this gloomy mood. At Tegynus, a Theban general made a feast in honor of Mardonius. A hundred guests were present, arranged on double couches, a Persian and a Boeotian on each. Thersander of Orchomenus was among the guests, and in after days he told the historian Herodotus that his Persian couch fellow spoke these words to him. Since we have now shared the same table and wine, I wish to leave thee a memorial of my opinion, that being forewarned thou mayest look to thine own welfare. Seest thou these Persians feasting, and the host which we left encamped by the river? In a little while thou shalt see few of these remaining. The Persians shed tears as he spoke, and Thersander rejoined, It behooves thee to tell this to Mardonius. But the Persians said, Stranger, man cannot avert what God hath ordained. No one would believe me. Many of us Persians know it, and follow the army under constraint. 
No human affliction is worse than this, to know and to be helpless. Mardonius had taken up his position and constructed a fortification on the north bank of the river Asopus, before the Greek army had crossed the Scytheron. His plan was to act on the defensive. He would wait for the Greeks to attack him, so that the issue might be tried in a plain, when he would be able to reap the full advantage of his superiority in cavalry. It would, on the contrary, be to the interests of the Greeks when they descended from Scytheron, if they could by any means entice the enemy to give battle on the rough and high ground south of the river, where the cavalry would be of little use. End of chapter 7, parts 4, 5, and 6